Hi, welcome to the Candace Malcolm Show. I think most Canadians who worry about out of control government spending focus on big ticket items, things like corporate welfare, new unaffordable entitlement programs, or probably how the Canadian government sends money overseas to corrupt international institutions like the World Health Organization or the United Nations. And we also send money to corrupt and authoritarian governments through our bilateral aid programs. But I think most Canadians would probably be surprised by the amount of corruption, fraud, and lack of competition that sometimes happens right here in Canada in our own governments, both federally and locally, specifically when it comes to things like infrastructure projects. So our next guest today knows a thing or two about this waste, and I'm very pleased to be joined by Walter Panic. Walter is the former chair of Merritt Ontario, and he's a local contractor in Ottawa. Walter, thanks so much for joining the Candace Malcolm Show. Thank you, Candace. The pleasure is all mine to be here with you and to shed some light on this issue. Yeah, thank you. So I was reading a little bit about this sort of issue with what you call closed tendering or open tendering when it comes to government contracts. So I hope you can just give a very brief introduction to, to what it is you're talking about when we're looking into government contracts and how they are awarded. Uh, certainly. I'll, I'll just uh, give you a little brief overview, Candace. Uh, anytime, the, the, so being in Ottawa, you know, the federal government is one of the biggest buyers of construction services in our uh, nation's uh, capital, just given how many employees they have here, how much space they occupy. Anytime that they are doing any sort of uh, retrofit, and we're primarily electrical contractors and uh, also general contractors. So if they need an electrical contracting job done, a new electrical panel put in, they would post uh, uh, on, on Mercs, which is their government contracting or procurement website, uh, that they're looking for these services and uh, there's no as long as you comply and are uh, are um, capable of doing the work then you're able to submit a, a bid for this work uh, what we're seeing happening right now on parliament hill is well over two billion dollars worth of construction work where the federal government has abdicated its contracting authority to a third party and this third party is not able to meet the government's requirements of fair and open tendering in fact, one of the uh, <clears throat> contractors selected for this uh, parliamentary precinct project is signatory to many union agreements. Uh, therefore, you must belong to one of the unions that they are signatory to in order to be able to submit a quote, let alone do work on this project. <clears throat> so a company like mine, we employ 50, 60 people. I've uh, been in business for over 20, oh God, 1996. So. 20 some years uh, in business right now, um, have a great crew, very competent individuals, have done many projects similar to what's happening down on the hill. We're not allowed to even submit a bid and that precludes about 70% of us that are union free or open shop that will not be allowed to, to uh, put forward a tender because of okay, this. So just because you're not part of some club that the government created, they said that you have to be part of a specific union in order to Correct. qualify for contracts, you, you, you're not even allowed to apply to, to participate in these projects, to work on these projects? 100%. <clears throat> so in this example, uh, one of the contractors, Alice Don, is signatory to the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. Therefore, your company must be signatory to the IBW in order to even submit work. Uh, in Ontario, and this, this is pretty true across the country, with the exception of Quebec, where everything is unionized. But about 70% of all work done in this country is done by open shop contractors like myself. 30% by groups that uh, are signatory to different union agreements. So 70% of us are locked out of tendering this project because our employees choose to bargain directly with us. Uh, they're satisfied, you know, they're compensated well, they're, they're, they're flexible work hours, great working conditions. There's no need for them to actually to uh, to go out and to, uh, to seek a third party to represent them whatsoever. They're very, very happy in, uh, in the way that work is uh, working out for them right now. So hence, and we're not allowed to bid. And so, I mean, this, this almost sounds like a discriminatory, discriminatory practice to me, just because your workers choose that they don't need to be represented by a specific union. The government doesn't let them get involved. Oh, sure. what, what, other, what other consequences do they have? The Carter study I read uh, basically said that this created uh, that, that these regulations, restrictions on bidding serve as a petri dish for corruption in public procurement. We've read of other instances of fraud. What, what, are, what are the kind of uh, consequences of these rules? Well, I mean, first, first of all, we, we've seen all sorts of uh, tremendous cost overruns. The city of Hamilton building a wastewater uh, treatment facility, they were uh, 
they were unionized uh, quite some time ago by, I think it was the Carpenters or uh, Laborers Union uh, in Hamilton. Hence, everybody must be signatory uh, to that union in order to do work on those sites. Their costs were 30 to 40% over budget because of the limited amount of contractors that were then eligible to uh, tender. You know, it doesn't take a brain surgeon, Candace, to realize you're out trying to get the best price you could possibly get. The more people you invite, the wider the range of your pricing is going to be. You take the lowest compliant bid at that point. If you're locking out seven out of 10 contractors from being able to bid, then definitely you are not going to be receiving the best value for your money. So what is the government's rationale behind this? I mean, it seems like a pretty obvious uh, thing that, 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 that this is, again, I think it's discriminatory. Uh, these are laws that have been placed for a long time, not just federally, but provincially in Ontario, in Quebec. What, what is the justification for the government behind these restrictive rules? I don't think the government realized that when they, uh, when they abdicated their authority to, this, uh, to this, uh, um, these two companies, which are PCLL is gone, uh, to do this work. They were the only ones I believe actually put a tender forward. I don't think that they realized that uh, they couldn't comply with their own tendering regulations, which are very simply on the government's whole buy and sell uh, a website. It tells you that their objective is to acquire goods, services, and construction in a manner that is that facilitates uh, access to all contractors, encourages competition, treats suppliers fairly, and results in the best value for Canada. I would suggest to you that none of those four uh, subjects will occur uh, given their tendering practices right now. Well, certainly not uh, getting good value for money or having a fair process. I, I mentioned earlier how this leads to corruption and fraud. I think probably the best known example of that was what happened in Montreal. I think everyone's heard of the Charbonneau Commission that looked into uh, some of the deals that happened in the city of Montreal and sort of gave a bunch of recommendations. But what, what, what happened there and how, how is that related to these uh, closed tendering contracts? Well, you know, I, I think this is a very, uh, the Charbonneau, I mean, I, I followed that relatively closely too. And I still remember the uh, McLean's Magazine picture of the Badam with a suitcase full of money, you know, and, and it was ironic. I mean, as they say, the roads in Quebec are paved with gold because it costs more to pave a kilometer of road in Quebec than anywhere else in this, uh, uh, in this country. Uh, it's very simple, Candice. When you limit competition, then you, you limit the amount of people that are bidding. Uh, it encourages uh, collusion. It, can, it encourages uh, many different bad bidding practices, and it definitely does not get you the best value for your money. Well, I, I think, yeah, I think we're seeing that all over. I mean, one example that stood out to me in that Cardis report was this is in Kitchener, Ontario. There was a, um, basically Kitchener was looking to build a simple brick public washroom. Um, and the lowest bid that they got because they had these restrictions that blocked out 40% of people who could, uh, or more than 40% of people who could 70%. potentially bid on these. 70%, okay. Yeah, so the lowest bid to just build a simple public brick washroom was $564,000, and that didn't even include the land. That was just the construction costs, which, again, you don't have to be super familiar with <laughs> construction and costs of things. Wow, five hundred. I mean, that's the cost of building a house, not not a bathroom. For sure, you you could build a four bedroom home in Ottawa for that kind of money, let alone a little single person washroom, right? But that's just a very classic example, Candace, of what you see happening when you restrict uh, competition in any industry whatsoever. You know, I live in Ottawa. I'm not sure uh, where you are if you're in Toronto or not, but I'm in Toronto. Yeah. Yeah, so I pass apartment buildings every single day. I live right downtown. And I look at them and, and, you know, they're an iconic building. They belong to every single Canadian. They belong to you, uh, to me, to our employees, to every single person that is, a, that is a citizen. And every single person should have the right and the ability to tender freely any work that comes out of any of these uh, new projects that come forward. And the reality is that is not happening. And yet our taxes fund this construction, Candace. So glad well, we take our money to fund these projects. We just won't take our labor. Right. I mean, one of the things I wonder is, you know, do we have a ballpark idea of how much this is costing Canadians? Because we often hear, you know, when it comes to these infrastructure projects, we have to take out large amounts of debt. I mean, that was Justin Trudeau's whole pitch and proposition to Canadians back in 2015 that they're going to take on some debt to build some infrastructure. You know, we hear a lot of times about raising taxes and, and doing other kinds of schemes to, to fund infrastructure projects. But, but how much would Canadian taxpayers save? And how much more could we get for a buck if we actually, you know, followed the recommendations of Merit Canada and opened up tender to all Canadian companies? 
Well, you know, Candace, if you look at that CARTA study and you look at the cost overruns anywhere from 20 to 40 percent on a billion dollars, that's 200 to 400 million dollars, you know, of, of, of infrastructure money that be going that could be going towards other projects, you know, um, uh, instead of uh, what's happening right now with these overruns. That's wild. They're definitely not getting definitely not getting their value for their money. Well, yeah, we're all not getting our value in a matter of much fewer we, we would be in debt, how smaller our debt would be if we took some of these recommendations. And then there's also an impact on companies because like you said, uh, seven out of 10 construction workers are excluded from employment. Um, I think one of your campaigns said that the, um, the way that the government has these bidding contracts basically it could lead to thousands of construction workers losing their jobs because they just don't have enough work uh, because of the unfair uh, laws that the government had. So what, what is it that you're proposing and, and what, what can Canadians do to fight back against these unfair laws? Well, I think Canadians can, first of all, I mean, this is a matter of fairness, Candice, and this is what I, I really don't like about this, right? I mean, every company should have the right to, to, to tend to this work and to basically stand on their merits, right? They're, either, they're going to qualify or they're not going to qualify. If they don't qualify, there's a specific reason. But if they do, if they're competent, if they can do the work, they can finance the work, there shouldn't be an issue. Every single person that can should be allowed to work on these uh, uh, on these projects. You know, we're going through, a, you know, we see what's happened uh, and how COVID has ravaged our economy. You know, we have many people that are at home right now not working because sites have been closed up. We have many companies that have closed their doors uh, until COVID uh, is over and uh, the quarantine period is over and they can get back to work. So, we're all going to be fighting for uh, uh, for work. It's going to take a while for things to ramp up. And the sad reality is that we will not be able to uh, tender this work on Parliament Hill, which we should be able to. On top of this, there's also, I <clears throat> read recently, there's over a billion dollars worth of work coming to the West Memorial Building, I believe, and the uh, uh, Supreme Court of Canada building. So again, you know, we need to stop this because this is just keep perpetuating itself and we will not be getting the best value possible. So what other recourses do, do you and your, you know, your company and your workers, what do you have? How can you fight back <clears throat> against the government uh, for, for, for imposing these really restrictive rules that, that do hurt your business and, and they're unfair to all Canadians? Yeah, this is the top part. Uh, you know, Candace, we have provincial labor legislation messing, meshing with a federal project. We've had a, uh, a legal opinion done by a well-respected local law firm, and they believe that uh, we should be looking at, and our best chance is a charter, uh, a charter challenge actually. And basically, it's they're stating that uh, the mandatory requirement for a union affiliation in order to present a bid for this request for proposal is a violation of the freedoms of non-association under Section 2D of the Charter. So we're looking at that uh, a lot uh, closer. And, uh, you know, we're going to fight. This is not just a, a local fight. This is a fight that will take us right across this country, Candace, because the federal government has buildings from coast to coast to coast. And I believe that every competent company should be able to put forward a bid, uh, regardless where in this, you know, this beautiful country of ours we actually live. It should be open. It should be transparent. Every single company should be able to bid. So, Walter, one of the questions I had was about the differences in laws between the previous Conservative government federally under Stephen Harper and the current government of Justin Trudeau. Has Justin Trudeau made this problem worse? Is it the same? Has he been better? What, what, what's your diagnosis here? Um, I think he's made it a lot worse, Candace. Um, if you remember back uh, during the Harper years, he had brought forward uh, Bill C-377. It was Rusky Bear that brought it forward. It had to do with union financial disclosure. And uh, any expenditure over five thousand dollars was going to have to be actually listed. You remember, unions uh, do not pay any taxes. So on all the dues that they collect, uh, any revenues they have through training halls, et cetera, they pay absolutely no taxes. Estimates are that's in the range of two point five to four billion dollars worth of uh, income that's not being taxed by the federal government, which could result in about eight hundred million dollars in, in revenues for this government if they wanted to go there. Uh, Stephen Harper had brought in 377. It had passed uh, in the Senate. Uh, I still remember that day very, very well. And uh, the building trades had gone to Trudeau just in the 2015 election and had thrown all their weight and support behind Trudeau. And guess what he did? 377 is no longer around. He got rid of that nice piece of legislation. 
So there's a very close and relationship. Sorry, well, to that, that piece of legislation, it required unions to pay taxes, and was, was it to do with transparency no, as well, or what was it? No, it didn't require them to pay taxes, but I think this was, this was a potential first step. Uh, see, unions don't pay any taxes on any of the revenues that they bring in, right? And I mentioned it's about two and a half to $4 billion worth of revenues that they bring in. They were going to have to disclose every transaction that was over $5,000 in value. So if they were taking a trip to a convention in Vegas, they'd have to disclose that. Instead of a line item on their balance sheet uh, that would show uh, travel expenses, for example, or on their income statement that showed travel uh, expenses, uh, if it, it would all have to be broken down individually instead of one lump sum of a million dollars or whatever it is. Okay. And they were not, uh, they did not want to do that. Don't know why we can only uh, make assumptions as to why people would not want you to see where uh, their money is actually being spent but um, I, I think that they realize that there's so much happening it's if union dues are supposed to be used for collective bargaining purposes and that's why they're not taxed but collective bargaining for most unions happens once every three years over a look, two three four month window or so right so the rest of the time you know those funds are being used to uh, operate halls to lobby the government to ensure that union only work happens on projects like fire the hill and none of that money is taxed so i think they saw the writing on the wall which is why they didn't want this uh, legislation to be around anymore so 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 harper had demanded that they have more transparency with the with the money that they were getting uh, yeah. a break on from the tax perspective and then what did trudeau do so, so they, these unions backed trudeau in the 2015 election and then what, right. what happened after that uh the bill ended up uh, they, they they never moved forward with uh with the bill it never came into legislation and it, uh, it basically just died with the new government they decided not to do anything with it and i thought it was okay listen financial accountability is huge candace for every single person you know, uh, and for taxpayers uh, as a whole to ensure that we are getting the best value for our money. And if the money's not being spent where it's supposed to be spent, then maybe there is a, a reason to tax it. And what was Trudeau's sort of explanation, justification? Why wasn't he pressed on, you know, uh, allow, uh, forcing more accountability? Because I recall when Justin Trudeau was first elected, his whole thing was that he wanted to make government more accountable and that he wanted to change the way things were done in Ottawa. But this seems like reverting back to the old corrupt ways of the liberals of the past. Well, people, people have, don't have very long memories, Candace, right? You know, those that were involved in this, uh, in this fight to bring uh, financial disclosure to the forefront uh, for, uh, for unions uh, believe that it's a, it's a good thing to do. And, and um, why is he not being pressed? You're the press. You can press them. You know? <laughs> Well, we, we had to not try, Walter. <laughs> you may not get part of that six or eight hundred million dollar fund that he's got set up if you press it too hard, Candace. <laughs> well, I, I don't think we were going to get that anyway, Walter. <laughs> but uh, it's certainly certainly disappointing to see the sort of lack of of tr uh, accountability and, and transparency there from a guy who who literally campaigned on that kind of stuff. Well, for sure, you know, and 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 and, and to me, this is a this is a the underdog. This is. You know, we just don't have the resources that these big labor organizations have, Candace, right? Um, so, so, I mean, they've done extremely well, and, and they lobby hard, and, and they try to do the best for their members at the expense of 70% of the other people in that same industry. And that's what I don't think is fair. Set up rules that everyone can abide by, that are fair, that are transparent, and then may the best person win. May the best company win. May the lowest compliant tender win. What they're doing right now is they're picking the winners and the losers. And right now they've considered 70% of us to be losers that they don't want to deal with. So, yeah, I, I, wish, I wish this was a bigger issue that uh, was every, on every Canadian's mind. And it should be Candace because it's, it's about getting value for our tax dollars and it's about uh, fairness. And we all want to you know, believe that we live in a, in a fair and just world, but there's still a lot of work to be done. And that's why we're pushing this issue. Well, that sounds like a very noble uh, challenge, and, and hopefully uh, you take that because I think that we should uphold our charter rights, and, and we should we should be very serious about those. And it seems to me like a case that you know not only infringes your ability to to, to have access to work, um, but but also again it leads to all kinds of consequences like like we see with corruption and fraud. Well. Walter, thank you so much for joining us on the Candace Malcolm Show and breaking down this issue. Again, it, it's almost obscure when you first hear about it, but then the more you learn, the more, you know, it just seems like a, really a common sense problem um, the government has because they operate kind of behind closed doors and people don't know a lot about it. So thanks for joining us and, and uh, best of luck to you with, uh, with these projects. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking to you.